Okay, so now to the lecture that we're going to have this evening, which is being given by Professor Sean Harding. Uh, can I first, before I introduce Sean, ask you to make sure that your phones are turned off uh, and to remind you uh, that the fire exits are at the back and here and there won't be any fire drill. Uh, so if the alarm goes off, it's for real. Now, Sean this evening is going to talk to us about the organ, the heart, which is central to our well-being. It's sometimes referred to as a miracle in motion. It sustains our entire life blood and moves it, of course, around our bodies. Uh, it also, of course, uh, affects how we feel. Um, historically, it's changed a bit. Uh, one time the heart was thought to be the seat of the emotions, then it was the brain, and then more recently, the gut. Um, poets tend to prefer the heart. It's a bit <laughs> nicer to be thinking of missing a heartbeat than to think of uh, what the gut might do when it's squelching. Uh, but we're going to hear much more about that uh, from Sean this evening. Now, Sean is based at Imperial College London. She's an internationally renowned scientist. Her research has primarily been on the muscle cells. The heart, of course, is a muscle, and she's worked on the muscle cells uh, and how they might fail. Uh, but she also celebrates the wonderful design of this organ and uh, has been involved in developing new therapies to restore, repair and rejuvenate the heart. And we'll be hearing more about that. Sean has been head of the uh, cardiovascular division at Imperial College and also director of the British Heart Foundation Cardiovascular Centre for Regenerative Medicine. And the title of her talk tonight is the same title uh, as the book that she rec recently produced, The Exquisite Machine, The New Science of the Heart. Sean. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me here. It was a little intimidating to be invited to the Royal Philosophical Society um, because the heart is it's sort of a meaty pump, really, and, and didn't seem very philosophical. But actually, there is, there is some philosophical things that I think are going to come out of this talk. So um, I, I wrote this book, which is mostly for the general public, because... I, I, I've, I've been working on heart disease for 40 years and you're working on the heart, you always have to talk about it in terms of heart disease. Obviously, that's what we want to do. We want to, to think about heart disease. And it is the, the, the biggest killer still, heart disease. But I just became more and more, uh, you know, impressed with, with the heart. Every time thing we tried to do it, it, it kind of already did it better. So it was very difficult. And I want to argue that it wasn't just the incompetence of the scientists that have not produced any of these solutions that we wanted to do, but because the heart is so great. So I'm, I'm um, uh, just going to see. So, you know, we've got the heart producing 100,000 uh, beats a day, 30 million, 30 billion in a lifetime. And, you know, you've only got to miss 240 of those. And that's curtains. That's, uh, you know, good night, Vienna. Um, and you think about engineering in a general sense and think about your washing machine if you had your washing machine it 10 washes a day for 100 years you'd be producing the same sort of uh, thing and you know that that's not you know, nothing is going to, have to be like that and and particularly what shows that we can't produce engineering like the heart is that we haven't produced engineering like the heart there hasn't been um a, a proper uh, off-the-shelf artificial heart, uh, even now. And the race, so, so to speak, for the artificial heart was started just after that for the moonshot. So uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, JF Kennedy said, by the end of the decade, the 60s, we'll have a man on the moon. Uh, 
then just a few years later, DeBakey challenged Lyndon Johnson to do the same, have the same sort of moonshot thing for, for a total artificial heart. And you know that what's happened with the uh, the, moon, the space exploration, even with 50 years gap, and we're only just going back to the moon again now, but the other things, the Mars rover, the, the satellites, the web telescopes, all of those things, what, what we've done. But we really still don't have an off-the-shelf uh, artificial heart as, as a, a destination therapy. We've had many, many uh, attempts at these. These are all the different ones that actually got to some kind of, of clinical trial, but many failed. Uh, they did actually have one by the end of the 60s, but really it was supporting the patient for hours rather than uh, had for, for their lifespan. And um, it's been a, a huge challenge. Um, uh, this is the, the mechanism of the heart itself, just a refresher here. So you've got the uh, unoxygenated blood coming back from the body through the at right atrium into the ventricle going through the, uh, the lungs. So there's two separate circulations, the body and the lungs. It comes back oxygenated into the left atrium and then into the powerful left ventricle where it's expelled and, and, and supplies all of the needs of the body. And so the, the, um, the best thing we have at the moment, the Syncardia temporary artificial heart, really only has the, the ventricular chambers here. And, and it can support uh, the heart temporarily, particularly looking for a transplant. But the, the kind of engineering you, you, you need for this is just so incredible. Um, for example, these the ventricle chambers have to be matched in their output. Otherwise, if it becomes unbalanced, that, that's uh, a problem. And so if they're even five milliliters difference, one teaspoonful difference in a beat. Now, at the end of the day, you can do the math very easily. That's 500 liters difference. So, you know, the, you have to be have the most incredible engineering for this. Um, we have one of the better ones has been the partial artificial heart, which leaves the heart in place and just brings uh, the blood from the ventricle into the aorta in a separate loop so that it just supports the, the heart. It's a ventricular assist device. But here, um, you know, it, it's uh, subject to many of the same problems, for example, power. Uh, the, the kinetic uh, requirements of the heart are huge. The, the molecule ATP, which uh, produces that naturally, produces that energy, is continuously replenished. If it wasn't, you would use half your body weight every day just in producing that, that molecule. So that really the amount of uh, kinetic energy is enormous. So you have to have an external battery, you have to have drive lines is going through the skin and, and all the problems that, that come with that. So what is it about the heart that's so, so incredible in terms of its structure? Now, this is the heart muscle. This is the, the left ventricular muscle. This is a, a cross section of it. And these are the individual cardiomyocytes or cardiac muscle cells. And, and here, they're about 0.1 millimeter long here. Um, you can just about see them in a test tube with the naked eye when you hold it up. This is one in a, a dish. Uh, it's being superfused with a solution and, and electrically stimulated. And you can see it beats very nicely. It can do this for a couple of days. Um, this is, uh, and these will be wrapped helically. This structure is wrapped helically and every cardiomyocyte is, is connected electrically and function mechanically to many other cardiomyocytes and it's this really solid jigsaw that 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 makes the heart so amazing to, with, with electrical stability uh, this is a cardiomyocyte dying um, this is uh, what might happen during a heart attack you can see that that's happening in real time now as much sort of ventricular fibrillation in an individual cell and there's the other cell going now and um, about 2 billion of your 5 billion cardiomyocytes uh, can die during a heart attack. And these are never replaced. And, and this has been one of the mysteries of the heart, really, that if you think about these tissues in your body and how many of them regenerate, your hair grows all the time in places you really didn't expect sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the skin, you're used to that healing up well, your muscles can grow. But but. The two organs you might think of uh, as, as 
well, pretty important. You can now, I think you really need all your organs, honestly, but you know, you can't say one is more important than the other, but you, you really would think the brain and the heart would have some regeneration and, and the heart, you know, well, the physical mechanical work it has to do. It seemed crazy that this has so little regeneration. There was huge decades, decades uh, of arguments. If anybody who's been in the field will remember these about whether there was any regeneration at all in the heart. And it was only because of this really curious um, uh, sort of what you might call natural experiment that actually showed us that there was any at all. Um, obviously, carbon dating, you, you generally, you're thinking about fossils, you're thinking about hundreds of years, millions of years. But there was a time when, because of the nuclear bomb test, there was a spike of radioactive carbon put into the atmosphere before they decided it might be a good idea to put them underground. And um, so if you're born along this timeline, you can carbon date individual cells. Um, and so it's possible to tell whether if you take after your death, you, you look at the cardiomyocytes, whether they were the, the, the born on your birthday or, or after your birthday, as it were. And from this, we were able to pick up a, a very small turnover rate, 1% a year uh, when you're younger and dropping to half a percent or so at, at age 75. But that means, you do the maths, that, that for a normal kind of lifespan, you know, 80, 90 years, uh, you will have had about half the cells from the moment of your birth to the moment of your death. Those, those little cardiomyocytes have, have been with you for all that time. So just, uh, I, I find that incredible. And what if the, the heart is rather like the brain, it, it, it adapts as it must do to things like uh, pregnancy, for example, when your blood volume goes up enormously. Um, uh, it, it adapts to changes in load by changing the size and the connections and the arrangement of the cells. So rather like you have with the, with the synapses. And so, for example, if you have high blood pressure, um, you you will get a hypertrophy of the heart. Hypertrophy of the heart. The wall will get thicker, uh, and so it'll it'll produce more force to um, to to expel the blood. And the cardiomyocytes will get bigger uh, in in to to produce this effect. So the we have to think about the the also what the heart has to put up with. So we, we know that it, it it's uh, great, but it, it really there are a lot of uh, you know, threats to the heart as you go through life. And on the on the left here, you've, you've, you've things that you probably know about, aging, sadly, smoking, high blood pressure, lipids, exercise, lack of exercise, diabetes being a big one, alcohol, um, that's quite an interesting one. There's still a little, a little get out clause for alcohol, still the curve is U-shaped, so still teetotalers do slightly worse, uh, worse than those people who drink a small amount of, uh, of alcohol, although the amount's getting smaller all the time, but uh, unfortunately. Um, so just, uh, you know, there's just a little ray of hope there for us who like the wine. But um, things you, you, you might not know about, infection uh, has always been known to be a problem for the heart. I mean, it, it, you probably, because of COVID, uh, you've realized this more now, but the COVID was, particularly problematic for people who had heart, underlying heart conditions. And COVID attacked the blood vessels and blood vessel lining particularly, so uh, the heart, but many other organs too. But that's been known for flu, for all, many other infections, uh, specific cardiac infections or general infections for a long time. Chemotherapy, unfortunately, because both of these diseases tend to occur in the same demographic, ca uh, cancer treatments are... are uh, uh, been found to be very damaging. What the, the thinking is, is that even that little bit of uh, you know, cancer cells uh, multiply uh, out of hand. Um, and so that's what you're trying to do is kill those dividing cells. And so the, the idea is that this, these chemotherapy agents are killing off even that tiny bit of regeneration that you've got in the heart. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of work around um, producing better chemotherapeutic agents, producing, uh, so treating people who are going through chemotherapy with heart treatments, monitoring their heart at the same time. Then the psychosocial stress and, and, and emotional shock, I'm going to deal with in a little while, so I'm just gonna leave those for a moment. Uh, but pollution, and, and that's the evidence is growing every day for this. This was one of the studies that was done at Imperial, the Oxford Street study. Um, 
And for those who, who don't know London, so this is Oxford Street, which is one of the main shopping streets. And particularly where, before we had the clean buses, when we still had diesel buses, very polluted. And this is Hyde Park, which is at the other end of it. So not crazily different in, in terms of the, the uh, atmosphere here. Um, but this is a rather nice park. And so uh, volunteers, healthy volunteers and patients with heart and uh, lung conditions uh, were asked to walk for two hours at their own pace, uh, just on one occasion, either uh, up and down Oxford Street or around Hyde Park. And they had monitors uh, for pollution and monitors for their own cardiac function. And the good news, if you walked around Hyde Park, you get a boost in your blood vessel function. And that lasts a couple of days, actually, even for a, for a gentle walk around, around the gardens. But the opposite was true, just going down o Oxford Street. Then there was really measurable, even in that time, there were measurable decrements, reductions in force, uh, or in cardiac function, and reductions in respiratory function. So that's a bit alarming, really, when you think about uh, the polluted atmospheres that we do have. Uh, then hidden genetic conditions. Um, uh, the, this is interesting that about one in 250 people will have uh, some kind of variant of a gene mutation that will compromise the function of the heart. Uh, often very mildly, uh, actually, um, but uh, um, one of the, these is um, uh, titan. Uh, this is uh, the molecule, in fact, in that cardiomyocyte that's a spring that helps it to spring back after each beat. And uh, the people with genetically dilated hearts, um, poorly functioning hearts uh, with a cardiomyopathy, uh, up to 25% of those have sight invariants. And so it's a big cause of that genetic cardiomyopathies. But when they looked at the, the uh, healthy volunteer group, they found that nearly 1% of healthy volunteers, uh, uh, so it's a healthy volunteers for the variants, here's the patient population cohort, and then these, the, the dilated cardiomyopathies. Um, and, and so there are people walking around who have these mutations. And it, it, studying these people, it's emerged that they can be healthy for a really long time, or perhaps all their lives, but if second, they have a second hit, the second thing happens to them, and that can be pregnancy, it can be chemotherapy, it can be uh, even moderate amounts of alcohol, then they can be tipped into uh, a cardiomyopathy. They're much more susceptible. This is the double hit hypothesis, that, and it could, can be that they've also got polygenic variants, other variants and other genes that, that will, will either protect them or tip them into to this. And so that's just one. Uh, but there are, are quite a number of other uh, variants that can have the same thing. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, sorry, I've lost, I've lost a slide here. And the, uh, 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 and um, just go with this one. Um, so the, uh, the, one of the main things obviously is that uh, the death rate for heart attacks are falling. Um, but the incidence of heart failure is increasing. And this is because any kind of damage to the heart, uh, whatever it is, produces a second wave of damage where then the heart is responding to this damage by trying to overstimulate it. So uh, a lot of people survive heart attacks uh, or live with hypertension or diabetes or the other things I've talked about. And this produces a cardiac damage. And um, what happens then is your heart will try to compensate for this. It will produce that hypertrophy, it will thicken, it will dilate, it will expand so that it can push out more with less effort in each beat. Uh, you will retain water, uh, swollen ankles, uh, um, uh, water around the gut, for the ascites, or uh, adrenaline. Adrenaline is uh, usually used, usually encountered when you in the fight and flight response it stimulates your heart when you're trying to get away from, say, a predator or in, in, in evolutionary terms. But uh, it uh, is is activated um, continuously when you are when you have some kind of cardiac damage, and the underpowering of the heart is is being sensed. So your heart is trying to to uh, compensate. But all these um, uh, 
uh, produce a further wave of damage. And this produces, uh, finally, they will decompensate. Finally, they will run out of road and you will go into heart failure. And uh, there, this is, is uh, outstripping the heart attacks. There's 200,000 200, new diagnoses per year, about nearly a million people living with heart failure in the UK at the moment. So a heart attack, um, uh, the difference between these two, a heart attack and heart failure. You're probably familiar with the, the symptoms of a heart attack, which should be quite varied. Uh, pain, pain in chest is the obvious one, but it can, can radiate. You, you, you'll, you'll feel impending doom, you're gray, sweaty, very tired, you might be nauseous. And that's the characteristics of, of the heart attack. That's when you definitely should dial 999. In heart failure, it's more insidious. It starts with breathlessness and, and, and you, you get less and less able to exercise. You have this water retention, swollen ankles. It was called dropsy uh, in, in, in the ancient, ancient times. Uh, extreme tiredness is the main thing. Fatigue uh, is the main thing. And, and this uh, really has a, um, uh, is, is what we're trying to, to look at at the moment because so many people are acquiring this heart failure. And why is this? So what's, what's happening here? Why is the body kind of attacking itself or, or overstimulating itself? And one of the, the reasons is because we didn't really evolve when heart attacks were very common. And what the body is trying to do is it behaves inappropriately. It's, 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 understands it needs to stimulate the heart, but it's using what it might have done for the fight and flight response. It knows that you, it's losing blood somehow, and it's responding as it might do to hemorrhage by closing down your blood vessels and retaining water. And so these things, these, uh, these, these, these kind of reflex um, uh, changes that try to stimulate the heart, that's fine. That the fight or flight response is fine when you're you're just trying to do you know you're running for a bus you're you're trying to get out of the way of a car coming, but it's when it's prolonged for down, for months and years that's when they become really damaging and so adrenaline is a damaging uh, hormone it can produce very bad disturbances of rhythm in the heart it can kill off cells, and it's because this this emergency response has become prolonged. Now, um, it's interesting. I, I want to just talk a little bit about the heartbreak connections with adrenaline in terms of, in terms of emotion. Um, uh, because as, as I, you said in the introduction, the heart was once very strongly associated with emotion. Then it was not associated at all. And now we're kind of thinking there are more things, you know, there is more interaction than we thought. So when you have this activation of the fight and flight response, what's happening is that the, the autonomic nervous system is being activated. And this is the nervous system that gets on with things when you're not thinking about it, breathing and your gut, gut things and your heart. So your heart is beating, your heart can beat um, uh, by, it doesn't really, it doesn't really even need your body actually. Um, I've definitely gone into the operating theater when they've taken out a, a failing heart, put it on the side for me to dissect, and it's beating away quite happily. And, and we also take you know, uh, hearts and put them up in the lab and we can beat, they, they will beat away by themselves. So that it beats by itself, but it's, it's the, the force and the rate of contraction are modulated by your sympathetic nervous system with adrenaline to increase the rate of force. And the parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve, the inhibitory nerve, is that the sort of the yang to the yin, yin on this system. And uh, that now calms everything down again. So this is your activator system and calming system. But the interesting thing is that this happens without your conscious knowledge. So uh, you, you, you might see something and you will, you will have the impulse to run. You, you, will, you will feel... Uh, uh, you need to, you feel, feel anxious, you'll feel fearful. Um, uh, and uh, there are in, in the heart, there are little ganglionic plexuses, which also contain not only nerves that respond to this, but uh, the, the sensory nerves that feed back to your brain. So what happens is you, you, you get the impulse of fight and flight response, and then your brain, your heart, 
tells your brain that you've got something to be worried about. So their heart, the brain then has to work out what's going on. Suddenly your heart's got rate's gone up and what should it be doing about it? And uh, so the, the heart rate itself going up can not be a, a symptom of anxiety or a result of anxiety, it can cause anxiety. And so if you play um, uh, uh, a racing heart, a facing thumping heart uh, to somebody and you tell them that's their own heart, you can produce anxiety, you can produce a panic attack in people because it, it's, uh, it's now the brain is understanding that sh it should be frightened. Um, there, there's some incredibly, this is incredibly sophisticated, this, this particular system. Um, here, uh, these, this is an experiment where people were shown subliminal flashing images of uh, something to frighten them. And they, they, what they picked was something that's guaranteed to, to set this off is seeing a frightened face. So it's a social thing that when you're seeing people being frightened, you understand that you should be frightened too. It, it sets you off. And, and the key thing about this frightened face is that you can see all the way around the pupils. Um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can see the whites of, of your eyes, you see. And I wondered, there's, there's um, a, a, a phobia, and I wondered if anybody had it here, because often it is the case when I ask people, the, the audiences here, um, a trypophobia, a fear of holes, uh, uh, when people are uh, horrified, uh, can't look at pic pictures with lots of holes in them. Have you ever heard, seen that, anybody? Anybody here? No, no, we're all too, yeah, too resilient here. Um, but it's, it is a, it is a re relatively common phobia, and I think that this is what it comes from. This 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 uh, this sort of this, these these uh, uh, frightened eyes. So uh, if you if you um, uh, play a sh a flash the images, either a frightened face or a neutral face, and you get uh, a fear intensity rating, you can see that. So this is this scale here, sixty eight to seventy six. So this is the the fear that will produce fear uh, either at it, it, whatever you do it during the heartbeat. And this is what a neutral face will, will produce, which is right down here at number 12. So you don't get a, a, a fear response. And the fear response is your skin uh, uh, electrical activity. So, so the how sweaty your skin is, uh, um, how, uh, how much it conducts uh, um, electricity. So if you flash this frightened face at, at the different points in the same heartbeat, you can get a different response. At the, in systole, which is when your heart is contracting strongly, then uh, your heart is activated and then it relaxes in diastole to fill up again. And so it's more activated in systole. And if you, if you show the face in systole, your fear intensity is, is, is uh, uh, rating is higher than if you show the face in diastole. So even the difference between heart one, you know, you know, half a second between the beginning and end of your heartbeat, you can you can react differently to these fear stimuli. Um, and so that that's your your heart is telling you how to feel, that it's telling you to feel frightened in this particular case. I should just though add something a little bit more philosophical. Um, uh, that the, this this uh, feeling of of sweaty palms and a racing heart is not only felt for anxiety. It, it can be, you know, pleasant excitement. It can be sexual attraction, and the the possibility is that you can and and, and there have been uh, sort of um, paradigms designed to uh, uh, harness this. That if you uh, put uh, the a couple together and you induce this sort of uh, heart rate, uh, a, this excitement, they can, when they're looking, their brain is looking around for a feeling to associate with this, they don't see anything to be frightened of, but they, 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 they see uh, somebody they might be attracted to. And so um, your heart is in a sense telling you, pushing you towards love. And they're, they're, that's why you're, it's always been said that you should go on a roller coaster on your first date or go to a horror movie on your first date because you're going to produce this kind of arousal. It's so basically just arousal. And so then the, the uh, sort of most extreme uh, uh, 
association with emotion uh, and the heart is this, this uh, syndrome that I've done a lot of work on called broken heart syndrome. Um, and this is, it, it is statistically shown that you're more likely to die soon after your spouse has died, for example, than uh, you know, at any time uh, during the pre previous year or the previous the, the, the following year after afterwards, and um, and and so this this thing about dying of a broken heart uh, is a very real phenomenon, and this massive agent adrenaline surge uh, is is underlies this, and so this can be not only uh, bereavement, it can be. Um, uh, the bereavement of, of, of spouses, it can be bereavement of a mother and child like uh, Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher, it can be uh, other kinds of emotional shocks, it can be uh, if you, even if you're a bit too happy. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so uh, the, the uh, things like a surprise birthday party. You know that you may argue about whether that that is a nice surprise or not, so there is a sort of ambivalence there. Um, and um, there is uh, one disease particularly that's associated with this, uh, Takotsubu cardiomyopathy. And this is a very interesting, rather rare condition. Um, and uh, in this condition, this is um, mainly seen in, in postmenopausal women, about 80 to 90% are female and, post and, and of those, most of postmenopausal. They come into hospital uh, thinking they're having a heart attack. They have all the ECG changes and the symptoms of a heart attack. And about three to 5% of the patients who come in with heart attack symptoms will have this. But when they're imaged, first, they, there's no blockage of the vessel is found. There's no plaque, there's no uh, clot, but they have this really odd pattern of contraction where the top of the heart here is contracting extremely vigorously but the bottom of the heart, the main chambers of the heart, are really not contracting at all. And this produces this odd uh, shape on the, uh, the imaging, which is, it was first seen in Japan, and they called it Takotsubu after the octopus pots that they used. Um, so that, uh, as I say, these are the triggers for that. Um, uh, bereavement, arguments, uh, physical exertion, so not only um, in strong emotional ex exertion, but physical things. Football, both playing and watching, uh, are very big triggers for uh, these kind of uh, these kind of things. Um, uh, a, su a surprise birthday party, as I was mentioning, son's wedding. Then, uh, uh, um, a so taser stunning, restraint in custody. That's a very interesting one. Then various other um, medical conditions. Uh, um, uh, the anaphylaxis, for example, an EpiPen can produce this, this syndrome. And um, even the uh, testing your heart when you come into hospital with dibutamine, uh, that can do it too. And, and all of these are associated with, with adrenaline. So all of these are associated with adrenaline or adrenaline-like uh, syndromes. And so broken heart syndrome has two meanings. It has this Takotsubu syndrome, where um, 80 to 90% of the patients are postmenopausal females and uh, many of them recover from this they 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 have five percent mortality and then sudden cardiac death which is um when your heart uh, goes into a, a ventricular fibrillation a, like a, a rhythm which doesn't which is completely dis disorganized and your heart can't expel blood and if you're not defibrillated then that will produce cardiac death arrhythmic cardiac arrest uh, within four minutes, so uh, death. And 80% of that actually is in males. Right? And exactly the same things are associated with that. Um, uh, in fact, there's a very interesting uh, study about two, a husband and a wife, both uh, watching a penalty shootout in Brazil. And uh, they lost, uh, and it was, they were both upset. And this triggered a death in the husband, a coronary death, and the broken heart syndrome in the wife, Takasubu, and she recovered from this, actually. So very interesting uh, control study in a way there. And young women seem to be relatively protected from both of those things. And so what, we th what we've done a lot of experiments, what do we think is that adrenaline is, is uh, when adrenaline rises, it re-increases your heart function. 
when you get to high stress levels, it's very prone to give you arrhythmic changes like cardiac uh, fibr ventricular fibrillation. But in, the, if in Takotsubu, adrenaline switches to another pathway which shuts down parts of your heart temporarily to stop them going into this arrhythmia. And we actually had a, an experimental model in a rat, a, a anesthetized rat, where we used uh, a dose that you would be right for a, a rat, an EpiPen type dose. And this produced Takotsubu syndrome very reliably. But, and then we tried to prevent it with drugs that we thought we, we worked out the pathways uh, and tried to block off this other pathway of adrenaline. But what happened there was it, instead of having Takotsubu, it was, they were flipped into a sudden cardiac death, the ventricular fibrillation that would produce that. And so what we think is that Takotsubu syndrome is actually an aborted sudden cardiac death episode. It's the least worst thing. Uh, uh, sort of, it's a natural protective mechanism against uh, excessive adrenaline stimulation that's that's uh, still still uh, it, it lingering in in the the uh, postmenopausal women, and also although I haven't got time to go into it here, that chronic stress can tr to make you more likely to 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 have these problems with with acute stress. Okay, so I'm just going to that's 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 all about the bad stuff that can happen to you. So I'm finally getting on to some of the good things we can do. And so what do we have for treatment of heart disease? And uh, we have uh, drugs. We have lots of drugs. And we, one of the things we have are drugs to prevent the, the actual things that underlie heart disease, like statins to prevent myocardial infarction, blood pressure control drugs, uh, anti-diabetic med medications. And then we have drugs uh, when you have developed heart failure to prevent the body going into this overload and, and, and overstimulating the heart. And actually, many of these are the same drugs as you are using for blood pressure control. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, but many people here might be familiar with some of these, these particular agents, uh, I couldn't possibly say. Um, uh, and we have, uh, so we have vas revascularization. So when you have a blockage, you can have a stent put in various other repairs like valve repair. We have very sophisticated pacemakers, implantable cardio defibrillators for people who are likely to get uh, an arrhythmic problem. We have transplantation, although we know the limitations of, of the number of, of donors here. This is what we have. And, and, and we have made huge progress in, in uh, uh, so that we have people living with heart failure rather than dying of heart failure, a bit like the cancer journey here. But what do we lack? What we've been trying to get and really struggled hard to get. And so uh, the full artificial heart I've mentioned already. Uh, gene therapy, um, that's uh, um, uh, one thing that I, I was, um, so you have these mutations, these variants, and if, can, you, can you fix these? And I did try, I was involved in an early gene therapy trial I have to say the heart was extraordinarily resistant to any of the gene therapy vectors that we used, um, unfortunately. So really didn't want to be infected with those. But now some of the things like CRISPR-Cas and other gene manipulations look as if they might be able to help uh, now. And the British Heart Foundation have just put 30 million into their Big Beat Challenge to find cures for genetic heart disease in many different an imaginative way, so that that's uh, an ongoing thing. Um, and finally, what we really need, though, is uh, regeneration. We need new muscle for the heart. Until you can put back those cardiomyocytes, you're really not going to go go any further. You're only going to get back to around here. And so, this is really what we've been really struggling with for for some years. Um, so we've tried various things. So first, I told you at the beginning that the cardiomyocytes have a low rate of turnover. Can you, could we do something about this? Could we stimulate this? So everybody looked at all the pathways, they uh, designed drugs to, to um, uh, uh, you know, produce this stimulation. And yes, they could, you could. Uh, there was a, a microRNA, which is a tiny length of, of uh, uh, RNA, which controls genes rather than making a, a gene protein. So, 
And, and in the large animal models, this did allow cardiac muscle to be regenerated. But the problem was seven months, several months after this, the, the animals developed really severe disturbances of rhythm. And so what we think is, is happening here is that, um, so when you've lost a cardiomyocyte, say you've lost the one in the wall here, in order for this, the cells don't normally divide. In order for it to divide, it needs to break down all this very sort of uh, strong structure, the contractile elements that pull the, the heart and, and make it contract. And so it needs to de-differentiate. It needs to lose its main structure. Then it needs to re-enter the cell cycle because none of these other cardiomyocytes are all terminally differentiated. It needs to divide in two, uh, and uh, these ones will become will be immature when they are the small and weak when they first divide. They won't have the structure, so they need to build up again that structure. And so, what seems to be happening is that during the time that these uh, cells are uh, doing this, they're kind of out of commission. Not only are they not adding to the heart, but they are disrupting this very tight substrate of the heart, this very beautifully engineered substrate of the heart. You've got little bits of it, which are now uh, all uh, do, doing it, their thing in terms of cell cycle re-entry. And so it, there's only so much you can take. An uncontrolled cardiomyocyte division is destabilizing the heart structure. The electrical activity is being destabilized. And so, this, although very annoying, and of course we're trying to, to get a balance between the two, this is the answer to our question. Why, is it, why doesn't the heart regenerate? Because it can't. It can't stop. It can't stop to, to, to grow, grow some new cells, because if it does, then uh, the, the substrate, the, the whole structure will be uh, disrupted and it won't work properly. So, so this, is, this is it. This is you know, the, the answer to the question. So I think, you know, from a philosophical point of view, I try to get that word in again. Um, it's that's very interesting. So then we tried stem cells. Um, so you uh, all, I'm sure, heard of stem cells, and these are the cells that produce all the other kind of cells. They're uncommitted to start with, and uh, they, although they are a kind of cell, um, but then they uh, they they uh, uh, become um, differentiated into the specialized cells of the heart and liver, etc. And so the very first of all, they, 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 what they tried to do is to look to see if uh, the stem cells, there were stem cells in the heart that could repair the heart. Uh, the adult stem cells, like in the uh, arms, in the hair, in the gut, uh, they can regenerate individual tissues. They, they have a limited range of regeneration, but they can uh, regenerate the tissues. And after any amount of work and argument and uh, people falling out and uh, storming out of meetings and accusing each other of fraud, all sorts of things, uh, any amount of work, we finally come to the realization there probably aren't any stem cells for cardiomyocytes. Uh, you sometimes can see, you know, perhaps 10 cells being made in, in this way, but when you need, Two billion—that's really nothing. You, nothing to no, no, no consequence. So they, we couldn't do it that way. And so now we then we went to look at the uh, um, uh, uh, other cells first, other adult cell, stem cells, with the kind of vague hope that if you had a stem cell like blood cell, uh, but you put it in the heart, it would kind of decide. It would know where it was, and it would decide to be a heart cell. Um, one of the reasons that we wanted to do this is because when you give stem cells back to the same patient, there are lots of advantages. You, you, they're not rejected by the immune system. They don't need to be stored. You can give them straight back again. And so you could take, for example, bone marrow cells and put them, give them back to the same patient. You, you have to be careful. Sometimes they might be affected by the patient disease. Uh, there are other um, disadvantages uh, with those. Um, ideally, you would want something kind of project which you could give from one person to another so that you could test it for quality or make it into a tissue engineered product. But the problem with this is uh, that you're going to you're going to need immunosuppression because you're, you're as you do with an organ transplant now. And that's not trivial. That really ha having lifelong immunosuppression is a really problematic thing. So you can't do that lightly. So the autologous ones were tested 
and as I say, bone marrow cells, which were known for 40, 50 years to be safe for transplant, to be given back to the same patient, um, uh, were, were thought to be a possibility. And so we were introduced into the heart in various imaginative ways to try to, um, uh, to get that, that into the heart. And they, they did do something. Uh, this is, um, so there's really quite a lot of data on this now. There's some benefit, but not very large. So this is before and after the injection, uh, before and after. This is what happens with the placebo because they're generally given during another operation. So you've got the effect of the other operation there. And the bone marrow cells do have a statistically significant uh, improvement, better than placebo. But you see, it's not very large. It really is, is you know, when, you, when you've got, you've lost half your heart function, that really isn't going to do a huge amount. And it, what it never does is make cardiomyocytes. It makes new blood vessels, it secretes protective factors, um, and, and other, other you know, helpful things that we might be able to harness and in, improve, but it doesn't make cardiomyocytes. And all the other kinds of cells we've used, um, skeletal muscle, fat, cord blood, amniotic fluid, all the same, don't produce cardiomyocytes. But what do produce cardiomyocytes is, and what has been a huge success, are these pluripotent stem cells. And these are uh, uh, things like embryonic stem cells, which are uh, derived from the uh, 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 early embryo, about 10-day-old blastocyst, a, a, a group of cells which are a bit like cancer cells in the sense that they will indefinitely renew themselves, um, and that, uh, but then they can also be differentiated into every uh, organ in the body, um, apart from the placenta, in fact. And they can make cardiomyocytes, and a lot of work went into the protocols to make cardiomyocytes by using the kind of growth factors that you find in the early embryo and that produce cardiac uh, 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 specification. The problem with this was that the uh, this uh, used the embryo, and so there was destruction of an embryo involved. And many countries, many uh, didn't like this, and, and, and some banned research on it, uh, or wouldn't fund research on it. In the in the America, they depends what where you've got democratic or a Republican president as to whether you can be funded for embryonic stem cells. Um, and so, a lot of work went into. Um, trying to find an alternative. And uh, in 19, uh, 2012, uh, Yamanaka, Shinya Yamanaka, won the Nobel Prize by, for a method that could reprogram adult, as stem, adult cells, like skin cells, for example, as what they, they use. They could reprogram those to become just like embryonic stem cells. And they, uh, they are, there's, there's subtle differences, but they're very, very like those. And the induced pluripotent stem cell, which is what they're called, can differentiate into cardiomyocytes just as well as uh, the embryonic stem cell. And so we, we have been able to make uh, um, many, uh, um, uh, the, the, um, many cardiomyocytes, really probably even in, a, in, a, in a, um, an ordinary academic lab, you can easily make 60 to 70 million a week what, a billion by robotic technology, really probably limited only by the amount of money you have, actually, because it's just a really expensive thing to do. And so these, you can produce a lot of them. You can produce enough for, for, a, for a heart attack. You can produce uh, engineered heart tissue from them. They're very happy to join together and produce a kind of strip of muscle if you force them together by, say, putting them in a clotting medium. Here they are, um, this is about a centimeter long, which is a one, this one we made earlier. Um, and uh, this is uh, attached to a silicon post. You're looking at down on the silicon post. And so the, 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 they, they are attached to the two silicon posts and they're pulling them together. The, the muscle is pulling them together because it, it beats spontaneously this uh, pluripotent cardiac muscle. And so you have a tissue engineered muscle. Now, um, this is fantastic now. You have something that is specific to a person. So you know, you and we did it from people in our labs. We took them and made their pluripotent stem cells. Um, you have something that is that therefore will be autologous, will be 
matched to the person. Um, and uh, you, the first thing that's happened over and above the, um, the thought of a cardiac repair is that they're being used as a drug development and screening tool to understand uh, uh, cardiac mutations. Um, so if you've got a mutation uh, in, the, in your uh, heart uh, muscle, you, this will come out in, in the pluripotent cells, even though they're from skin. And you can test uh, drugs on them. You can test them from different people. So you can do, in a sense, a, a clinical trial in a dish uh, for those. And I'll just show you briefly we have something that uh, we did um, with uh, Chris Denning from, from Nottingham. Um, there was a bank of patients who had um, a very virulent uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which but they often died of arrhythmic consequences. So their hearts went into, into these damaging rhythms and they died from those. And we took uh, uh, skin cells from uh, the father who had this mutation and two sons, one which, who did have the mutation, one who didn't have the mutation. And uh, here they are the, uh, are the different uh, uh, engineered heart tissue ones. That one's up, let's I'll try going forward. Uh, only one of those seems to work, oh, that's a shame. So you saw the other one first. This one here, you, if you watch it, it has a little kick to it. Every now and again, a little double beat. So you can see it's not completely re regular. So there's that's a mild version of it. And this one, in fact, it didn't beat at all. It just fibrillated. So it almost looks the same as that, to be honest. Um, and uh, so they had the, the rhythm. And, and what you can do is, because you can um, gene edit the pluripotent stem cells really quite easily, um, is to uh, put, uh, take the, ca the mutation out of the carrier cells and you put the mutation in some normal cells, do a kind of crossover and see, see exactly how the mutation uh, uh, works. And uh, this can help us to understand how the mutation changes the function of the cardiomyocyte, which is not straightforward. It's been very interesting, in fact, with these cells to understand the long pathway from a mutation to what actually happens uh, in the heart. It can explain why people with the same mutation can have not only different severities of disease, but completely different symptoms. They can have uh, no disease. They can have a severe disease from the same family with the same mutation. And, and it's again, a lot of it is things like the second hit hypothesis, what's happened to them, or, or uh, different other genes that they might have that influence those genes. And what you have is a ready-made test system, and it has been done for patients. They've had their, their, their cells have been used, in, uh, they've made cardiomyocytes, tested out a number of drugs, uh, either for an individual patient or repurposed some drugs that were used for other things that turn out to be good for a group of patients. So that's, that's, that's been happening and, and um, re real results have happened from that. But going back to what we really want, which is the patient-specific repair. So if you can make engineered heart tissue from uh, the, a, a patient, you can, you can give them back uh, the muscle in, in those terms. And so that, uh, those, those, again, we went through the whole process with, with cellular models, with in, in, in the lab, with small animal models, with large animal models. And then, interestingly, we had something very similar to what happened with the regeneration uh, story, that once when you, if you inject these cells into the substrate of the heart, uh, they will, in fact, uh, produce new muscle. They will eventually, after a couple of months, link up with the old muscle, but actually what happens is while they're doing that, they disrupt the substrate of the heart so, so totally that now you get these huge arrhythmias. And so this is the time spent in ventricular tachycardia uh, in, for these particular different animals. So once again, we have the tools, we've come with new muscle for the heart, but we can't just inject it in. And so now the, just to wrap up the, the strategy that, um, people are using is trying to make the muscle in the form of a patch and to think much more carefully. And, and I think Godfrey Smith is here. I hope he was going to be here. Um, yes, he's here. And he's, he's heroically carrying on this work. I've been retired now, just gallivanting about for a couple of years, but he has been working uh, tirelessly 
you can see how tired he looks. No, I just joke. Um, uh, tirelessly to to understand how you can integrate that tissue safely into the heart. And so we, the, some of the experiments have been done with these larger patches, is two and a half centimeter on, on rabbit hearts, and and showing some some good effects uh, on there, some very promising results. And so that's that's where we're going with that. It has been scaled up. You can scale up the size of these patches quite quite uh, well. Um, it, you can't get them very thick because they they the oxygen doesn't get through. But you can. This is the, it's about the size of of palm of hand. So just about uh, what you would want for a, a human-sized patch. And uh, in uh, are these are our collaborators in, in Hamburg uh, who did this. And in Germany, they have implanted some of these patches. Uh, also in uh, the, um, uh, in the uh, uh, university, Osaka University, that Yamanaka worked, where he developed those IPS based heart cells first of all they've done a trial on, on these patches they there was one in 2018 although they used not completely developed cardiomyocytes but um uh but just uh, uh, sort of immature ones uh, hadn't quite become cardiomyocytes yet and and they put the um, cells on a fibrin patch over the heart and um, a couple of years ago there were some uh, early hints that these were safe I haven't really heard uh, heard very much more um, in terms of larger clinical trials yet. I think you have to be very careful with these things and and, and go very gradually uh, with with this when you're going into to people, and um, um, uh, you have to think very carefully about uh, uh, whether to use um, uh, which ones to use for the, for the different people. Uh, but uh, so, but at least it has it has come into the clinic in some to some extent. So this is about as far as we've got with this this regeneration. There's always the hope that we could print a 3D print. Well, 3D printing has become extremely sophisticated. Um, uh, it's probably this is probably been superseded. Uh, I should think actually. Um, and uh, you can print. Um, the heart, heart muscle, you can print the heart muscle. The blood vessels are the tricky thing. That helical wrapping is going to be a problem. And just given how long it's taken with the, the um, artificial mechanical heart, I'm not thinking we're going to rush through this in, in very, very quickly, but we do have that possibility there. And so I hope I have persuaded you that the heart is indeed exquisite. And you're even happier about your heart working at the moment than you were when you started off. And it does have some philosophical implications. So thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. We've got time for some questions uh don't get excited yeah really don't get excited don't get over emotional Okay, there's a question right at the back. Of course it is. Uh, does it make a difference whether you study the male heart or the female heart? Um, they, so, there are differences. Um, the size obviously is different and, and uh, there's some problem because a lot of the devices are made for, for male hearts. Generally speaking, you wouldn't be able to see from the cardiomyocytes in a dish that was male and female. It's quite subtle, quite subtle. And, and, and it, uh, um, it, it's to, uh, mainly influenced by the hormonal environment. Um, it's a bit difficult to study uh, uh, menopause in uh, uh, rats, or for example, because most ma mammals don't really have menopause. I think it's 
us, uh, the blue whale is pretty much pretty much it. I think maybe some chimpanzees recently. No, no. Oh. Okay, fine. Sorry, we won't, we won't talk about chimpanzees. Um, uh, so, uh, but it is the uh, it is really the hormonal environment. Um, there's uh, there are uh, sort of suggestions that the symptoms of male and female heart attacks are somewhat different. And my my uh, feeling is that that the difference in treatments that women get are not to do with that. They 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 are very similar. There's a huge overlap between the symptoms of of male and female heart attacks. So perhaps some slight differences, but uh, it's been a little bit exaggerated that one. I'd like to ask a question about, um, uh, I see it a lot in Glasgow, uh, the excessive taking of alcohol. And is it behaving like the adrenaline? It's just stimulating the heart too much. And if the alcohol is taking over the person, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the impact here, the outcome? And uh, why is it doing what it's doing? Well, alcohol is a toxin. And it does it does produce deaths of death of cells. It does also produce some activation of, of the sympathetic nervous system, which which itself can can do that. It's it's generally a, a mild poisoning effect for for a, you know a, um, a long time that we are looking at here with the uh, the alcohol. It produces um, a, a, you know death by apoptosis and necrosis as well. So um, in in um, in terms of, if you're thinking about it that way, it will be hard to uh, reverse alcohol death of, of the heart if, you've, if, you, if you have taken a lot. Um, it's true alcoholic cardiomyopathy when really very excess uh, alcohol is, uh, in, is taken uh, for over a prolonged period, then you can really see the, 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 the damage, the real physical damage to the heart. I don't know. Ask me what I haven't answered about the question yet, because I'm not completely sure. I know myself from seeing a lot of homeless people here, uh, the effects of respiratory failure and then going into heart attack in their early 40s, uh, mainly males. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. Yeah, I'm just noticing here from meeting a lot of homeless people. Yeah. Uh, respiratory uh, failure and heart attack, uh, early early 40s. Yes, well, respiratory, there's a syndrome called Cor pulmonale, as it used to be, um, where the the uh, work of pushing blood around very damaged lungs is a great strain on the heart. I mean, homeless people have many, many challenges, really. Thank you so much for that. That was very cool. I um, I was really intrigued when you said that the broken heart syndrome might be a like a sort of a protective mechanism, and I'm wondering if you think that's something that could be harnessed or utilized. So, for example, at the end you showed um, how it takes a while for the um, embryonic stem cells to sort of equilibrate and become part of the normal electrical activity, but then eventually they are part of it. So could you, you know, in that period where they're becoming part of the natural architecture of the tissue, induce some sort of broken heart failure type um, activity in the heart so that it's not doing its normal thing to prevent the arrhythmias while the stem cells become part of the heart? I don't know, something like that. That's an interesting thought. Um, an interesting thought to um, activate. So, so one of the 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 things this is I couldn't talk about this is very quite complicated. Some of the beta blockers harness some of those pathways. They're not only blockers; they they have some active effects, and some of them activate those pathways. And we have kind of considered things like that. Um, uh, so that's a, a very interesting uh, thing, thing, way to think about it. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Um, 
earlier on, you asked a very strange question of the audience about anyone in the audience having a fear of holes. And you moved on so quickly, I didn't have a chance to put up my hand. And uh, my fear is hot holes. <laughs> <laughs> Can that have an effect on my heart? <laughs> Yes, well, I, I should, we better not go on to it potholes, honestly, because the emotional response we might generate in this audience, they could be quite considerable. Thanks very much. You, you might expect to be able to explain cardiac damage as a result of exposure to toxins like alcohol or adriamycin or something, but can you tell us anything about the relation, the mechanistic relationship between psychological stress and uh, cardiac damage, as you discussed in your Oxford Street experiment? Um, the psychological the psychological stress, um, the... the uh, so. It's it's well known. Uh, so that, I think it's quite interesting, actually, because there, there seems to be a uh, an effect of heart disease on um, a depression, but also an effect of depression on causing heart disease. So so um, it, it's very difficult to tease these things apart because you would say, well, you're just ill. And so why wouldn't you be depressed because you're you got a bad heart? Um, but there, there, it's it's more than that. So there, there really is a, an effect of the brain on the function of the heart. The there's work stress is a, a known cause of cardiovascular disease, particularly the kind of work where you don't have control. Um, then social social hierarchy, stress of the social hierarchy over and above everything else. Um, it, it produces this. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of the um, the, the uh, civil service study the, uh, um, the, the, the that was done by William Marmot on, on civil servants, looking at people at different uh, points in the hierarchy. The civil servants who, generally speaking, have a reasonably well regulated lifestyle. They're not very extreme in other ways. Uh, so so, but there's in any hierarchy. Uh, like that, the um, people who are at the lower end have a shorter life expectancy than those at the higher end of the, the, the hierarchy. And in fact, if you have mice in a cage, the male mice uh, in a cage, and they establish their hierarchy with the alpha males, the, uh, the ones at the lower end of the hierarchy tend to develop spontaneous atherosclerosis. That's, that's the association. What's the mechanism? Is it is it hormonal? Is it uh, um, what is the cause of the damage? Um, so I, I will come back to the stress hormones. So particularly uh, adrenaline, and we know there's these very clear relatives, but things like cortisol, those, are, those kind of things as well. So those stress hormones uh, over a prolonged time produce this kind of this kind of effect. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Carl, and um, thank you for your talk. It's really interesting. Um, I'm a heating engineer by trade, so I, I know nothing about the medical field. Um, I just know that if a pump breaks in a boiler, then I can take it out, put a new one in, and your heating system will live for another day. So um, I, I don't know if I have a question more than uh, through your talk. I had some thoughts of thinking that, when I repair a boiler, it's a machine, take a pump out, put a new pump in, and that, that's it working. Um, does the medical profession have like this kind of denial of our natural process of we live and we die and 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 we're finding ways to fix the heart, which is probably a lot of a lot of what's wrong with it, maybe caused by lots of social factors as well um and then to, to add into the discussion about uh philosophic the philosophy and the, a philosophical debate of then you're talking maybe 
of deserving and undeserving healthcare. If we can, if we can fix it, then we should, and then offer equality of uh, to people that maybe have not had the best lifestyle and wreck their own heart, or people that have uh, uh, ge genetic dysfunction of their heart or something. So I don't know what my question is exactly. It was just some yeah. thoughts that, <laughs> yeah, that so crossed my mind as you were speaking. You're absolutely right that many, the, the health of the nation would be much more improved if you gave poor people more money. Uh, you know, it's, it's shit life syndrome. Um, that you can see, you can see uh, all, many of the, 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 those things uh, could be, could be cured if everybody had a more equal and uh, you know, balanced lifestyle. Yeah. Um, I attended a, I attended a talk um, about designing buildings and landscapes for people with dementia to um, you know, give them a better life, really. And one of the speakers, it was a whole semin series of seminars about it. One of the speakers was a, um, a woman who managed a care home for people with dementia. And she said one thing that was really very bad was to make pavements that were in different colors or different tones, sort of alternating, you know, patterns of black and white um, paving and things like that, she said, because people with dementia tend to regard the black pieces as holes. Oh, interesting. And it causes panic attacks oh. and, and intense fear in people with dementia. And I just wondered if that would be related to them then suffering heart damage that it could add to their condition. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I mean, the there is a strong uh, relationship between dementia and heart failure, actually. Um, the same, the tau proteins, I think we know now that can travel from the brain to the heart or possibly the other way around. But certainly the tau proteins in the heart uh, produce uh, heart failure. So they, the um, people who have dementia will often have heart disease, but it, it tends not to be aggressively treated because they've got bigger, bigger, bigger problems in a way. Thank you very much. Can I take you back to a fairly early part of your discussion, and you said that there are around 100,000 heart attacks in the UK, and, and 7 out of 10 survive. Do the 3 out of 10 die? And are women more likely to die than men? Because I'm a man and I want to outlive my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Well, statistically speaking, actually, um, uh, in, uh, when you're a young woman, a young woman, young woman, there's a, a quite a strong difference, and and uh, young women are pretty well protected. But as you get towards the menopause, it really equals up. It equals up, and actually, I think uh, out, out of uh, the sort of percentage of people who die tw uh, from heart disease, it's 24 for men and 21 percent for women. So it, it it's not that different in the end. So whether that you find that a comfort, I don't know. <laughs> Hello. So you said that um, broken heart syndrome mainly affects the bottom of the heart and stops that beating more than the top part. Um, does that mean that the broken heart syndrome affects the atrioventricular node more than it affects the sinoatrial node? Um, no, it's um, it's just the ventricles, the ventri in the ventricles, uh, within the ventricle tissue I'm talking, not the, the nodal tissue. And and the reason is because um, the the adrenaline can work at two different receptors, the beta receptors, and, and that's why beta blockers are called beta blockers because it blocks that. So beta receptors, the beta one receptor is a beta two. And the beta-1 receptor is very quite straightforwardly stimulatory. The beta-2 is, uh, is the one that can switch to this depressant uh, form 
it, it couples to do two different downstream proteins. And um, because the, the, uh, in the lower part of the heart, uh, there, there are more beta-2 receptors, that generally speaking, it's that part of the heart that becomes uh, immobile. It's not always the case. Sometimes it's different parts of the heart. It, it's not, it's, that's the more usual one, but sometimes it's the middle or the, or the top, but it's just an uneven distribution. Um, yeah. okay, do you want to say what's talk without a mic? I don't know. Um. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about converting the adult stem cells to um, be able to produce like a billion in a week for like £15,000 or dollars, does that follow the rule of technology where in the future we can expect to produce more, faster or cheaper or all three? Um, I think uh, there's, a, there's probably going to be a, a biological lower limit to how long it'll take to, to first become stem cells from being a, a skin cell and then go through the stages of maturation. I think we, we accelerated a bit, a bit as it is, but that probably will have weeks still in there. Um, the, the rest of the technology, uh, I think, uh, will, will to, to scale it up is is very possible. I mean, as I say, we did we just started to scale it up even in our in our small lab in, in spin of lasps. So I think um, there, there's a, there's going to be a limit as to how quickly you can do it, but it's not bad. Okay, uh, we have a question from our online audience. Uh, why does exercise, which increases heart rate and breathing rate, produce benefits for, to the heart, and what parts of the heart specifically benefit? Um, so uh, it's uh, a heart, or part of the heart specifically benefits. That's an that's a, a, a interesting point. Um, certainly the exercise does increase the in heart rate. It actually, um, uh, you know, what, what I'm often asked is if, uh, you know, if you have a high heart rate that's at rest, that's, that's actually quite a bad sign. You have a high heart rate at rest, and so a high heart rate is not what you want. There is, just as an aside, um, a sort of graph that's been drawn of species and how many heart, so mice have got very fast heart rates and they live for a short time. Humans have uh, slower heart rates and they live for a longer time. It's, it seems as if you've got as, as about as the same amount of number of beats for, for in your lifetime for each species. And you kind of use them up by going to heart, 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 fast heart rate, okay? But what happens when you exercise is your heart rate goes up a lot when you're exercising, but it then drops back down to a much lower rate when you're at rest and you're at rest for more of the time than you're exercising. So your heart is uh, in a, a more protected form without being overstimulated when you're uh, at rest. So that, that adaptation that you have as the athlete's heart rate is the um, the protective one of the exercise. One last question. Thank you. Is it quite safe to use a defibrillator machine on anyone when required? Is it what? Sorry, is it what? Is it quite safe to use a defibrillator machine on anyone when required? You have to be sure that their heart's in, in ventricular fibrillation because if you if it's not in ventricular fibrillation, you could push them into ventricular fibrillation. Uh, so you just have to be very very careful that you don't have a pulse. So just be careful of that. It, it's um, <laughs> yes, it's like um, uh, you you if you have you have struck uh, on on the. Um, on the chest with a, a fast cricket ball, for example, you can push yourself into ventricular fibrillation, or you can be pushed into ventricular fibrillation, but you can also stop ventricular fibrillation by a thump on the chest. It's sort of <laughs> kicking the television type. Um, I, I think we, we've run out of time for questions. Um, uh, sorry about that. I can see there are still more questions. Um, well, you know, we've had a very interesting talk covering a lot of complex science, uh, explaining to us really that 
the science of the heart is still to an extent defeating us, that we can't recreate this wonderful organ that we carry inside our bodies and often take for granted. If, it's not the fault of the scientists, that's what I was no, trying to say. No, 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 it's the, the, the wonderful, wonderful design that evolution has produced for us. Also, there have been a few tips like take your first date out on a horror movie. <laughs> but it also occurred to me that maybe one of the reasons why the heart attack rate is so high in men in Scotland has got something to do with the Scottish football team. <laughs> but I, 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 I won't go into that. You know what I mean, ups and downs. Uh, too much for us, really. Um, but I hope everybody comes away feeling what a wonderful, wonderful organ evolution has produced for us. So I'd like to thank Sean for leading us through that. Um, we have a couple of little things for you. Uh, the Society has a Graham Medal, which is often presented to somebody in the medical or chemistry area. So we'd like to present you with our, I'll take it out of his plastic bag. <laughs> and of course, the society paperweight. <laughs> And, and I just, this is our last lecture this year. We start again in October. Uh, there are some members trips planned. And as you'll have seen in the presidential address that I wrote, uh, because it's Lord Kelvin's special 200th anniversary this year, the members event will celebrate Lord Kelvin, but there'll be more about that later. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for being such wonderful members and for turning out and giving our speakers a great time, usually, and a grilling. Thank you.